<laughs> All right, so good morning. We are actually are meeting for the first time in this class. And I know it's been a stressful semester since they have like totally screwed up the schedule. Most of the other lectures I actually had on video, so you could watch the videos from my previous semesters in this class. So it's kind of lucky that we got this class to come back to because I don't have a video for support media. So we're going to talk about support media today, which uh, I broadcast live on YouTube. I think I put that in a disclaimer on the syllabus. So if you don't want your face shown on YouTube, don't jump up and start waving at the camera. <clears throat> uh, if you're in the witness protection program, that won't turn out well for you with facial recognition software. So um, just be aware of that. I broadcast these on YouTube so that I can then have them for previous or for next semesters so that I can put them on D2L in case I have to miss class or if somebody misses class, it gives them an opportunity to be able to see the, the material in the presentation. So we're going to talk about support media. I know there's an exam today and my other classes, I generally give you class time to take the exam even though it's on D2L. Um, I didn't do that with this class because on this particular exam, although there may be essays in this, cl in this class on the exam, I didn't plan for an essay on this particular test. So the test is live. Has anybody checked on D2L to see if they can see it? It should be there. Yes. I hope. Okay. So it should be live and open, and you have a week from today to get it completed. So it's um, 25 multiple guess, true, false questions. I write the questions myself. I have a really good time writing the questions. I usually use my department chair in a lot of the questions. And depending on my mood any given day with regard to my feelings towards her, she's either a genius or a, a blithering idiot in the question. So you might, if you know Stacia, you might um, you know, get a good laugh out of a couple of them. So anyway, <clears throat> we're going to talk about support media. And then if we have some time at the end, I also want to touch on the IMC plans, which will be coming up and due at the end of the semester. So I wanted to talk about two different sort of approaches to that. If we don't get it today, hopefully I'll get to it next week. And then I give you one other week where we won't have class, where you have time to work on those in class if you need it. So support media. Um, all of the other chapters focus on the major sources of advertising for integrated marketing communication, the sort of traditional and big types of advertising that we think of when we think about marketing. One of the things that's nice about this class, as opposed to some of the other classes that I teach, is that this is the class that people think of when they think of marketing. This is the one where everybody, when you think of marketing, the first thing that comes to mind is advertising. They think that that's, that's all there is to marketing. And they don't realize that there's a lot of other subfields of marketing and some of those subfields we might not even think of as marketing. So for example, one of the oldest fields in marketing, one of the traditional first fields in marketing that started the discipline back at the beginning of sort of the industrial revolution was logistics. And people just don't think of that as being marketing, the place part of marketing. How do we get goods to consumers? But this is the area where people actually do think of it because they're so bombarded with advertisements all the time. We are constantly faced with marketing persuasion techniques out there. The clothes you wear, what's your sweatshirt, for example? NYU. Why do you have an NYU hoodie? It was at the thrift shop. <laughs> no connection to yeah, NYU. No so connection. I actually appreciate the NYU because my brother went and got a specialty. Do so we we're both lawyers. My brother and I are both attorneys. My mother wanted to have one attorney and one doctor. And I was the one who always said from a very early age, like four, that I wanted to be a lawyer. And then he always said he wanted to be a doctor. And then he started in on the science classes and dissecting things and decided he didn't want to do that. So he went and became a lawyer instead. After he got his initial law degree, which is called a Juris Doctor's Degree or a Doctor of Jurisprudence, he went to NYU for a specialty doctorate in tax. So he's a tax attorney for Goldman Sachs. So I appreciate the NYU yeah. hoodie, although you know you just you just picked it up at the thrift store. It's but it's that's that's advertising, right? I mean that's that's marketing persuasion. Why do people 
uh, why do why do schools do that? Why do we have hoodies and jackets and shirts and cufflinks with the UCO seal on them? Because it's a branding opportunity, right? And so it's uh, about trying to persuade people to come to UCO. And a whole plethora of things go into whether or not those kinds of persuasions are, 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 are effective. So in the prior uh, lectures that I had posted online, we talked about things like television advertising and um, radio and newspapers and those sort of traditional media. And next time we'll talk about internet advertising, which is obviously coming to be one of the dominant sources of advertising. But we're going to talk about all of those other non-traditional media that have sprung up and give us an opportunity to reach consumers in this, in this lecture. So support media are those that are used to reach a target um, that primary media may not have effectively reached or to reinforce and support a message. So historically speaking, why would we maybe have areas where primary media wouldn't have reached people? And if we think about this going back in time, and it's amazing to me because I was a farm kid, uh, at least part of my life. My mother was very much an urbanite. She didn't want to live out in the country. Although when she married my father, they did. They had a farm. Um, and my father continued. He now has a cattle ranch. Continued to um, engage in farming and ranching. And my mother, you know, they got a divorce and she moved to town and has sort of never looked back. She didn't like living in the country. It was not something that she enjoyed at all. Even though she was a very strong horsewoman, she just... You know, she wanted to have horses that were kept somewhere else and that she could go ride and then, you know, go back to the town where the city where you had nice restaurants and the conveniences of if you needed a gallon of milk, not having to run, you know, 15 miles or more into town to get that. So I, I grew up, you know, at least part of the time because my parents divorced on a cattle ranch in northern New Mexico. And I used to, when I would ask students questions like this, like, why wouldn't we have coverage in these kinds of areas in the past? I would have at least two or three students in Oklahoma that had also grown up on a farm or a ranch. More and more, I have fewer and fewer of those students. I, I think the last time I asked this question, nobody in class raised their hand and said that they'd grown up in, in sort of a rural environment. Has anybody in here grown up in a rural environment? No, nobody's grown up in a rural environment. So. Let me tell you about growing up in a rural environment. I was born in um, 1973. I'm a Gen Xer. And at that point in time, there was no internet. I know this is really hard to believe. There were none of these things that were attached to your, to your wrist constantly. And living out in the country, um, we had this huge, big antenna that went off of the house that got television. Television didn't come through a cable. It actually was broadcast and you had these, you know, huge antenna and sometimes it worked. We had three stations because cable did not come to the country. There was four, there was NBC, ABC and CBS. And then there was the PBS, the, the UHF frequency stations. So Television, and, and I remember a time when television went off. You all don't remember this. At, at midnight every day, they used to play the Star Spangled Banner, and television went off until six in the morning. I mean, it would, there would be the screen that came up, which was bars of colors, and after they played the national anthem, and then there would be like a beeping sound, you know, to let you know, like, you need to turn the television off. I, I know that that's foreign because most of you have the television going all the time. So in rural areas, particularly where you didn't get cable and you didn't have all of these other things, support media like billboards on highways and things like that played a, a major role of informing people, particularly of maybe local goods and services. So there, there wasn't a newspaper that came out to uh, our farm. They didn't, they didn't deliver the newspaper out that far. As I said, we only had ABC, NBC, CBS, and then the PBS station. We didn't have um, really great radio reception out there because in northern New Mexico is sort of a mountainous region. And once you get away from the urban areas, they didn't have the ability to transmit the way they do now and really reach 
that kind of that kind of audience. And so support media is is one of the, the sources that you would have in places like this that you wouldn't get from primary media, particularly for local businesses who couldn't afford maybe to advertise on the television. So many small businesses rely exclusively on this kind of media. They rely on it um, to make people aware. You see these billboards and people pay uh, to have their restaurant, they pay the state actually in some instances to list their restaurant on the ones that say at exit 151, these are the fuel and food services that you have. And then they may also have the larger billboards that are done by private companies that are like in Oklahoma. Um, I think Clear Media used to have um, Tyler Outdoor Advertising and, and things like that. Um, they're also referred to as below the line or non-measured or non-traditional media. And historically, the reason that they're, they're referred to as non-measured is because it was difficult to measure and get accurate uh, get accurate counts of how many people viewed it. It was not a precise science in terms of watching things. Now, this is really strange to you, again, for those of you who grew up with this device, because one of the things we know about, and we'll talk about this with internet advertising, is that you can tell with a great deal of precision how many people are paying attention. Not, not perfectly, but you can monitor things like in websites on Facebook, the number of click-throughs that you get based on your advertising. That was really hard to do. Basically with billboards in the, in the past, they would do you know, sort of traffic counts, but they were very, very inaccurate in many instances because there wasn't a good method of really measuring that. Now, with video, techno uh, video technology and other kinds of things, we can measure how many people actually go by a billboard in you know a given period of time and what times of day they're they're seeing it. But historically that was very difficult to, to count or measure. So traditional support media, what are what are the traditional support media that we have? Out of home advertising, things like billboards, street furniture, that's bus stops where you see them putting posters up on bus stops to make you aware of various advertisers that, that want to catch your attention, place-based advertising arenas, things like the banners that they have going around. All of you have probably gone to, at some point in time, a Thunder game or a baseball game and seen the banner ads that they have on the, the Jumbotrons or the sort of billboard advertising that they have around. If you've been to a Oklahoma City Dodgers game, the company I used to work for, the American Education Corporation, we used to have a suite at the at what was then called the Red Hawks. We've gone through several different iterations of the Oklahoma City minor league team's names. The current one is the Dodgers. But we used to have at the Red Hawks, we had a suite at the Bricktown Ballpark. And along with buying that for a season where we could take our clients and entertain them to a ball game when they came into town was a billboard in sort of the outfield that you had out there. So arenas and then transits, having them on things like taxis and buses has been uh, another area that, that marketers have used to get um, people's attention. Each of these has, of course, different advantages and disadvantages to the, the type of support media that are used. Um, you see a lot of these, we don't see as much of the street furniture, although you see some in Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma City area. And why is that, that you don't see as many of these in places like Oklahoma City? So this is a good, we'll get a duck if you answer the question, attempt to answer the question. Why do you not see as much of this in places like the street furniture in Oklahoma City? You see some, but not as much as you would see if you went to some place like New York or Chicago. Most people have cars. Somewhere. Most people have cars. That's West, correct. West, West, that's, West, that's, um, I don't know that we have less homeless people, but in New York City, I assume so. Oh well, yeah. I mean, in terms of sheer numbers, um, of course, most of these advertisers are not trying to reach homeless people unless they are, right. you know, providing a service to the homeless, like the Oklahoma City shelter. But we just don't have a lot of bus stops. Where you see street furniture is where you see places that have a lot of mass transit, like Chicago and New York, where oh. we have lots of bus stops, lots of 
railroad or not railroad. Um, having a senior moment here. Subway? <laughs> subway stations. Yes, a lot of sub. So you have furniture in the subway station where people sit down and they place advertising on things like that. We really don't have a lot of that. In fact, I tried at one point in time, there was a bus stop right outside my home in Oklahoma City when I lived in Oklahoma City. And I thought, well, that would be, be kind of cool to take the bus. I was working at UCO as the Associate General Counsel for the university. And I thought that would be really cool to take the bus to work someday and I figured out that I would have to get up at like four in the morning to get here by eight because you had to go from my house, which was in Edgemere Park, down to the, the transportation center. And then it made something like 50 stops along the way to get to UCO, which is one of the reasons why in places like Oklahoma, we don't rely heavily on mass transit because it's just so vast there's such a huge space and area that you have to cover you know manhattan and all of new york could fit comfortably in probably less than half of the land mass of the oklahoma city statistical um, metropolitan statistical area so if, if you take into account that what they used to refer to as the smsa which is standard metropolitan statistical area goes in the north from um, the town that I currently live in, which is Guthrie, all the way to south of Norman. I think that's Purcell. That's all considered part of the SMSA. And in the east, it goes from Shawnee, because we built up communities all the way from Shawnee in the east to um, El Reno in the west. That's all considered part of the, the Oklahoma City Metroplex now. Manhattan could fit in like one quarter of that amount of size or less. Is, is Oklahoma City like one of the biggest like cities per like square mile? At one point in time, Oklahoma City was either the second or third largest geographic metropolitan statistical area. We've been taken over our other, other cities have annexed more area. Um, and grown faster. So like Dallas, Fort Worth, that Metroplex is now considerably larger. And if you think about it, when I was a kid growing up, we would go to Dallas to shop for Christmas. That was a big thing to go to the Galleria oh, yeah. and go to, go to uh, the shops and see the ice skating rink and things like that, that they had there for, for the Christmas, actually they have a year round, but you know, they would decorate with a big tree in the middle and people would be skating around. And that was a lot of fun. And once you left sort of Norman, there was nothing until you got to um, Denton. There was nothing in terms of development. Now, the minute you hit the Red River, it's basically one part of the Dallas Metroplex after another. I mean, starting in Gainesville, you see significant urbanization from, from the, the Red River, basically, all the way to you know, Waco in the South. Uh, Houston is another area that, that is just has become huge, but because of the large geographic area, you see less of the street furniture than you would in places like uh, New York, but we still have some. There's still some, you know, bus stops and things like that where you'll see outdoor street furniture. Sure, in, in I I'm in the wrong class. You're in the wrong class. Yeah. Okay, all right. I didn't wanna swap that That's out okay. Really, what class are you supposed to um, be in? Business ethics. Business ethics. Oh, okay. I mean, That's you, across you, the hall, actually. Is it? I okay. think I looked at because I was looking for the. Um, I just I don't remember the class number after we've been online for like a month. I know. Yeah. That's understandable. I appreciate it. Thank you. So putting it in transit on buses and taxis again, you'll see a lot more of the transit based in places like New York City and Chicago. Although now people are getting their cars wrapped and companies are paying you in. Um, the uh, free fuel or giving you fuel cards if you'll get your cars wrapped. So the majority in this category are billboards and street furniture. This is, in urban areas, one of the most pervasive forms of advertising. So what does pervasive mean? I tell students that marketing is a pervasive discipline. What does the word pervasive mean? Uh, 
Nobody? Nobody knows what the word pervasive means? It means that it is everywhere. You have a hard time in these areas escaping it. You see it constantly. If you go out, once you get past El Reno in the West, because we've had sort of a beautification campaign in many areas and many states and many locations, they don't allow as many billboards as they used to. Again, when I was a kid growing up, I-40 was littered with built. There were billboards everywhere. And coming from New Mexico, there was a billboard every single mile once you got outside of Albuquerque until you get this little dumpy community. And you would have thought that this was the great, you would have thought that it was like Disneyland. And I remember the first time I got to go there, I was, I always wanted to go because once you got outside of Albuquerque for every single mile, there was a tacky billboard going all the way West. And once you got outside of Amarillo from the East, every single mile, there was a billboard that advertised this little itty bitty hole in the wall called Klein's Corners. And the billboard said, you know, visit Klein's Corners, world famous, largest gift shop in a truck and travel stop in the world or something. And you would have thought that this was like going to Disneyland, the way they had these billboards. And when I finally, when we finally got far enough that I, I got to Klein's Corners for the first time, I think I was seven at the time. Um, and my grandfather, we, we went hunting and we actually went past Klein's Corners and he, he took me and I was like, this is it. It was the biggest bunch of crap I'd ever seen. It was a gas station with just, you know, a large gas station with a lot of crap. Now, I mean, by comparison, um, how many of you have been to a Bucky's? I love Bucky's. Bucky's actually has interesting crap. And they've got like, really, you know, but like Klein's Corners was nothing but rubber Tommy Hawks and sort of what would be very politically incorrect gifts today you know they had the the faux indian um I'm talking about is it the cherokee trading post now? no it's klein's corners we the cherokee trading post was the oklahoma version oh, okay. of klein's corners <laughs> but they did the it, it's it's in eastern new mexico on i-40 it's about 60 miles i guess from albuquerque or so and it's just this hole in the wall and i mean they had this huge gift shop and they would sell some Indian pottery and things like that, but mostly it was really these kind of tacky gifts that kids, you know, little kids would want, like the rubber. They became famous for the rubber, for the rubber Tommy Hawks. Again, that would be a gift that would be completely, you know, politically inappropriate today. But that was what that's what they were famous for. Um, Bucky's has now taken this to a new and high level. If you've ever been to a Bucky's, they've just got an incredible amount of stuff, particularly the one on I thirty five. Um, that goes into Dallas or the one that goes into Fort Worth on I-35W. Um, those are two, two of the big ones. I think their largest store is outside of Houston. And not only do they have this huge, massive store with something like 100 fuel pumps and, and a, a large assortment of um, gift items and food and, and all kinds of stuff, they also have the world's longest and the one out of Houston um, longest car wash to, to go through. That's one of their big selling points. So all are kinds of stuff. One in I don't know. I wish they would. Because I love Bucky's. It's great. I, I had uh, to go in my nest, my niece's birthday party and I stopped at Bucky's and they actually had like really cool children's gifts. Um, they had Melissa and Duck stuff which are a really, you know, sort of interesting learning um, product for ch products for children. So billboards, you had lots of these now in a lot of areas, they have started to limit how many billboards you can have because we had, like I said, in, in the 1970s and 80s, it just, I-40 I was just like a, an ugly clutter of all of these billboards. And they passed laws and regulations, uh, particularly like in, places like New Mexico, which limited the amount of outdoor advertising that you could have along the interstate. And as those billboards fell into disrepair for Klein's Corners, they were not allowed to put them back up. So it's one of the most pervasive uh, forms of media in urban areas, particularly where you can't escape it. You see things like the Golden Arches, 
you know, for McDonald's all over the place. And, and we are constantly bombarded with this. Then you also have digital out of home advertising. This has become a big one. Digital billboards. It's really cheap now to advertise. It used to be very expensive to get your ad put up on a billboard or to buy a billboard because the production time was so long and they actually had to paint them or, or they used like this wallpaper stuff. Now, even the, the billboards that are not digital are printed on um, a canvas screen and they can be put up and taken down in, in a very short order. And so the lead time is not nearly as great as it has been, but digital billboards allow for almost a, a constant rolling and changing at, at a moment's notice, just with a laptop computer and an access to the internet to change the billboard advertising. So we've seen a lot of growth in that. You're also seeing these now being placed in places that you didn't see them before. A lot of the restaurants now have, um, you know, television sort of billboard style ads in them. The gym that I belong to has a television up that has one of these, you know, scrolling ads through the through the through the television screen. Place-based out-of-home uh, media. This is one of my favorite aerial advertising. I'm a licensed commercial pilot. I have an airplane. And so I'm always fascinated by airplanes. And they used to do this a lot when I was a kid at big tourist areas. You don't see it so much anymore. They would do aerial like sky riding. Have, have any of you ever seen aerial sky riding done? They do it um, a lot still in Florida. That was the last place I've seen it. At a lot of the beaches during spring break, they'll have you know sky riders out there. Blimps used to be a huge thing. The Goodyear blimp would would be seen flying over sporting events, particularly football games and things like that. Um, mobile billboards, car wraps. The research suggests, with regard to car wraps, that there's a high level of recall and that they do have a, a fairly decent impact on sales. And then in-store media, displays, in caps, cart signs, um, things like that that they have that they put up, you know, banners that they will put up advertising the specials, you know, of, of the week in the store. And there is some research to suggest that uh, about 33% of shoppers, which is a lot, say that they're influenced by ads that they see in the store. Why is that? Particularly if you go into grocery stores, lots of people are influenced by these. What are you not supposed to do? What are some of the things that, as marketers, one of the things that we know is that, and I do this myself, we are more susceptible to marketing influences at various times. So if you don't want to be as susceptible to marketing influences, for example, when you go to the grocery store, what should you do? Don't go to the grocery store hungry. Yeah, don't go to the grocery. That's the biggest one. Don't go to the grocery store hungry. Everybody has done this. There's lots of evidence to suggest that if you go to the grocery store hungry, and, and I am a marketer. I have a PhD in marketing. And, you know, every once in a while, I will not follow this advice, and I will just be absolutely famished. And I always end up with, you know, $80 more of Jack's Link beef jerky and you know, crackers, what else? I don't know, peanuts than I had planned on buying. So don't go to the grocery store hungry. Those impulse purchases are, are easy and it's easy to, to persuade people to do that. There is a whole field in marketing called retail anthropology, which focuses on how to get people to buy those kinds of impulse things and what kinds of marketing persuasions are, are effective. The other thing that we know that you should do is you should, before you go to the grocery store, even if you're not hungry, you should make a list so that you're less likely to just start impulse buying or, oh, I think I've you know needed this and I didn't put it on the list. But if you make a list, you're less likely to do that. Transit advertising. And of course, these categories, when we talk about them, one of the things that we have to realize is that a lot of times we, we tend to talk about these as silos or, or categories that we think of as being unique and distinct, but a lot of these overlap with each other. So they're not necessarily just one or the other, but transit advertising, putting it on buses, subways, 
truck sides, taxis, wrapped vehicles, and digital transit that you'll see. Inside cards used on digital screens and buses and trains and restaurants. Outside posters that we put on the sides of buildings, roofs, buses, cabs, and then station platforms and terminal posters are, are some more of those kinds of things. I was noticing we took a trip over spring break and I was flying. We flew down to Fredericksburg and there are lots of lots of along the route um, businesses that have put stuff on their roof so that you can know what the business is if you're, you know, happen to be in an airplane looking down um, and flying over the area. So the advantages of out-of-home advertising, you get wide coverage in local markets. Frequency. Most people take the same routes over and over and over again. You generally tend to drive to the same places every day to go to work, to come to school. You all probably use the same route every single day because it's the most efficient route. Or maybe because, you know, Google tells you to, to, to take a route because something's blocked. Every once in a while, there are about three or four different ways I can get from Guthrie to UCO. And every once in a while, I'll vary the route just because I get so sick and tired of seeing I-35. Because the fastest route is to just come straight from I-35 to Cobell and then straight to UCO. I have like less than three or four stoplights if I take that route and almost no stop signs. So it's the most efficient, but I get tired of it. But by and large, for the most part, I'm running, you know, exactly on time when I need to get here. And so I take the same route over and over and over again. So you see a lot of frequency. They allow for geographic flexibility. So you're not, that's one way of eliminating wasted coverage is by having geographic flexibility in that you're not advertising to people who are not likely to, particularly with regard to things like restaurants, see and need that kind of service. They can be highly creative. The ones for Klein's Corners were very creative. They had all kinds of goods that they would feature on and talking about their world famous, this and that. Um, they were highly creative and, and very, you know, sort of engaging the mind of the consumer. There is an efficiency, effectiveness, 35% of consumers say that they have called a number as a result of uh, advertising that they've seen that's out of door or support media. It used to be that the production capabilities required a long lead time, but with laser printing and the ability to do these and put them up very quickly, the amount of time that it's taken to switch these out has dropped considerably. Again, it used to be that billboards, you know, were, were either hand painted or they were put up with sort of this kind of wallpaper stuff. And it took quite a bit of time to do them in production. And now that's no longer true because we can, we can produce them and they can wrap the billboard and take it down within a very short period of time. The disadvantages, wasted coverage. What is wasted coverage? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things, if you get on, um, if you get on the Broadway extension and you head south and you get to the Kilpatrick Turnpike and you take that exit <coughs> to head west towards like Quail Springs and stuff like that, there's a huge sign for BC Clark that is their, their Rolex advertisement. The reason I noticed the sign is because A, I have a Rolex, B, I bought it at BC Clark, and you know it's one of my favorite things, but the cheapest Rolex now starts at $5,000. That's the Air King model of Rolex. And Rolex goes up year over year. I think that sign is completely wasted coverage because the closest BC Clark store to that billboard 
is their North Park Mall location, and they don't have a Rolex dealer at the North Park Mall. Rolex has taken away um, one of their site location dealerships. So even if you saw BC Clark, and even if you could afford it, their closest location to that billboard is one that doesn't even sell Rolex anymore because they can't. They've lost their dealership for that site. You have to go to Class and Curve in order to get uh, a BC Clark dealer that's that's an authorized Rolex dealer. Or you have to go to downtown. And how many people can even start, you know, can afford a watch that starts at $5,000? Not a lot. So you've got a huge number of people that are passing that sign every single day that are never going to buy a Rolex, right? So you've got this huge waste and coverage that this big, big billboard, um, you know, maybe they would do better at that location if they did their pray for rain. Well, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to do a, you could win up to $5,000 if it rained on your wedding day towards the purchase. You know, if you bought a, a ring and it rained on your wedding day, they would give you up to a $5,000 credit um, on that ring. So maybe that would be a better advertisement than that because that's a huge waste of coverage. Um, limited message capability. So again, that, that location right there, as you're getting onto the ramp or as if you are headed from the east already on the Kilpatrick Turnpike, what speed are cars going at that point? Well, I think the speed limit on that portion of the turnpike is 75. There are now places on the turnpikes that the speed limit is 85. And if the speed limit is 85, what does that mean people are doing? They're doing 90, right? So if it's 75, they're probably doing 85 already. That's a very short period of time in order to see that. And this is particularly true of the digital outboard media that's that change. And I've actually been, you know, like interested in something and it's like changed because I'm passing by. There's a digital um, billboard on I-35 just south of Frontier City. And there have been several things that they've been advertising that I was like, oh, that looks interesting. And by the time I got close enough to see like the web address or the phone number, it had changed and, you know, I'd zipped right on, on by. The wear out is another disadvantage. The cost, uh, particularly if you, if you do, the, they will give you better deals the longer you will take the billboard. So Tyler Outdoor Media, if you will take the billboard for a year, for example, will give you a much better monthly rate than if you take it for one to three months. So we can have measurement problems, accuracy, uh, accuracy issues and measurement. Again, this has become easier to, to do because we can do traffic counts with a high degree of precision. Now in the past, that was really hard to do. They used to actually put out these things that would run across the area of the road that would be a manual counter that would count every time a car went over the, the equipment. Now with video technology, they can put things on there and you know it's very easy to automate and count the number of cars. Of course, you still don't know how many people are actually paying attention, what they're doing in their car. They're usually listening to the radio and feeding their kids and, you know, I'm talking on the cell phone. And so there's all these sort of distractions that you can have. And then you can have image problems with regard to the, uh, the type of advertising and the quality of advertising that you have. And you may have brand dilution. One of the reasons that Rolex took BC Clark's dealership at, at North Park away is because Rolex wants to be an exclusive brand. And I think maybe by advertising, I mean, I, there could be a brand dilution problem. Generally speaking, Rolex's own advertisements don't focus on billboards. Where does Rolex advertise? Well, they advertise in high-end magazines, and they usually sponsor high-end events like horse shows. Right? And we're not talking about rodeo. They, they don't. I used to be a member of the cantina at the Lazy E. And they don't sponsor stuff at the Lazy E. That's not the clientele. But at Hunter Jumper shows, you'll see advertisements for Rolex and the programs and places like that because they view that as not diluting the brand. Whereas a billboard, 
I mean, generally speaking, what billboards advertise are sort of things that are more of convenience products. You're, you're hungry, you see the sign for McDonald's, you're traveling you know, across country, and you get off and, and eat McDonald's. So you can have these image problems that, that can create a brand dilution with regard to billboard type advertising. The advantages of transit advertising. The average ride on mass transit is 45 minutes. So in places like Chicago and New York where people use mass transit because cars are expensive, if you live in the city, you will probably pay to park your car. When my brother was uh, had an apartment in in New York City because he works he works for Goldman. He's been transferred to their Dallas office. But when they had an apartment in the city, to to pay for parking for a month was something like two thousand dollars. That's more than most people's mortgage payments in Oklahoma. Right. So you you see a lot of people not having cars and using mass transit. And as a result, the time on mass transit, particularly buses, can take a long time. And so the average ride time is 45 minutes. So you've got a large amount of time where people are exposed to your message. If they're riding a bus, you know, to go to work in Oklahoma City or Manhattan, and then it takes you know an average of 45 minutes ride time. Routes are generally standard in most urban areas. Most people take the same route over and over and over again. And so you're getting that constant reminder of your product out there to the people that are seeing it. And generally the costs compared to things like television are, are pretty low of, of having transit type advertising. The disadvantages, again, in rural areas, it's non-existent. We don't have good mass transit in places like Guthrie. Guthrie is actually kind of unique. We have something called the First Capital Trolley, and they actually do, do a pretty good business. They pick people up and take them to their doctor's appointments and stuff like that. But we don't have the level of mass transit that you have in places like Chicago or New York. And Guthrie is unique because we got a big grant. A lot of small towns don't have that kind of... Um, capability or infrastructure. And so it may not be existent in places like rural Northern New Mexico. The other problem is that the mood of the audience can have an impact on what they feel about what they see in products and services that are advertised. So subways in New York, if you've ever been on one, how many of you have been to New York and been on the subway? Just two of three of you. It's kind of a frightening experience. For years and years and years, the subways were, were full of um, problems with crime that has decreased. They've done a lot to clean up the subways in New York, so it's not. But it's still, you've got a lot of people standing around, getting in, getting on, particularly at the early morning rush hour and the late evening rush hour. You've got people that are trying to pack onto a subway and get where they need to go. And it's crowded, and of course, this can lead to anxiety and, and impact the way you feel about the things that you're seeing and experiencing. And so that can have a negative impact on the perception that you have of products that you see in those kinds of areas. So how do we measure these kinds of communication persuasion or advertising in marketing? The Outdoor Advertising Association of America developed a new audience measure system in 2010. So this is something that has, has been evolving and it, it gets better as time goes on. We have the capabilities of doing a lot more than we did in the past. Again, when I was a kid growing up, you know, not every home had a computer in it. And if you did, it was pretty simplistic. I remember the first computer that we got for our home. It was from Radio Shack and you'd spend like, you know, hours writing a little program to get it to do one very simple, stupid task. And then my mother got for her real estate office, she had the first uh, real estate office that had a, a computer in it. Um, it was an IBM and it actually, the we still have remnants of this. If you look at the save icon on Microsoft Word or Excel or something like that, it shows you this 
what what was the hard floppies this one was actually one that ran on um five by seven big floppy disks that were actually floppy and they were sort of very delicate and so we've gotten much better as things have progressed and of course that will become even more and more accurate in in the future as we have the ability to really do um, more and more studies on what it is that people are seeing. So the traditional measure was the opportunity to see how many people just passed by the billboard on the Kilpatrick Turnpike in a given day. You know, what, what was the average traffic count? What was the traffic count at various times? So what was the opportunity to see? Now they're using a more likely to see metric. And we have new data that includes eye tracking, travel survey data, um, and combining those things into one rating. So what is eye tracking? Well, it's looking at what it is you are actually watching. And we can do this with a high degree of precision, particularly with regard to studies on um, not so much out, out of house advertising, but what you're watching and seeing and looking at on things like your computer and television. That's become much more uh, available. And as again, the technology improves, that will improve with regard to even out of house or out of doors advertising. There are a number of sources that can give us information on these kinds of measures. So competitive media reports, Experian, Simon's Marketing Research Bureau, and Geopath all combine statistics on these kinds of uh, measures. But again, it's still, even as, as we've gotten better and better, it's still an imprecise because it's not a one for one where we can absolutely tell. On a computer, we can tell how many people click through and not only how many people click through, but how many people actually purchase, right? How many of you have clicked through on an ad and then not purchased or just browsed? Lots of us. I mean, every single one of us has done this on a mobile device as you're sitting there in a doctor's office and you're bored or you're in class and you think that I don't notice that you're, you know, on your phone and looking down. Um, you're, you know, looking through Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is that is the latest social media platform that that has got your your interest. What is the big social media platform now? Do you think TikTok? TikTok? You think that's the the biggest one now? Yeah. Um, you can tell how many people not only click through, but how many people then actually go on to purchase. I mean, it's a, a very precise way of measuring, and we still don't have that level of precision with regard to outdoor advertising. But it's getting better. Promotional products. We all have had these. So um, the Promotional Products Association International gives a definition of what promotional products are. They are advertising or promotional medium or methods that use products such as ad specialties, premiums, business gifts, awards, prizes, or commemoratives as part of the marketing plan or the integrated marketing communication plan. Um, specialty advertising is often both an ad and a sales promotion. And it's used a lot by nonprofits uh, to get you to you know, commit and buy and support their product. All of us have seen, for example, the advertisement, I absolutely hate them. I turn them every single time that they come on the ASPCA ads that show all of the dogs. I'm a huge animal fanatic. I love, I do, I do animal rehab and rescue currently. Um, I've had all kinds of animals that, that have been brought to me to rehab from squirrels and uh, raccoons. Raccoons are generally the hardest. They're, they're enormously destructive, but squirrels, the last squirrel we had um, passed away a couple of years ago. We couldn't let, we couldn't release her back to the wild. Currently I have two, Prairie dogs that can't be released that will live with me until till the end of time. So I like I love animals. I would rather um, spend time with an animal than another human being, which shows a somewhat dissociative personality disorder on my part. But you know, you see the ad and like the ASPC ad, I, I just like you know cry every time and I have to turn the turn the channel very quickly. But what do they give you? They give you things like a photo of a dog that you're helping rescue or a blanket. Um, St. Jude's does this. They give you like this blanket with this bear. If you've watched the St. Jude ads. So those are all kinds of promotional 
items. And again, a lot of nonprofits use them because they remind you and give you good feelings about the, the contribution you're making to the overall societal benefit. The advantages of these are that you have a lot of selectivity. The communication is delivered to a desired recipient. You also see a lot of these being used in political marketing. So for a long time, I used to teach a class called Political Marketing here at UCO. And that's actually how I sort of got interested in marketing because my undergraduate degree, my master's, and my Juris Doctorate are obviously not in marketing. They were in political science. So I started teaching a course called political marketing, and that's what really got my interest in, in marketing and ultimately led to getting the PhD in marketing, or one of the factors that led to my getting the PhD in marketing. You see a lot of these in political campaigns. Candidates will hand out, you know, as they go door to door or as they go to the bean suppers. I'm, I will tell you that I am a lifelong Democrat. I used to be chairman of the Logan County Democrat Party, and I was a, an elected official. And so Democrats, unlike Republicans, have a tendency to do a lot more sort of um, glad handing and baby kissing, particularly in the past. It was just a required if you were going to be a Democratic candidate that you go to all of sort of the county fairs and barbecues of the you know Logan County Democrat women would always host like barbecue and bean dinners. And you'd have candidates, all of these, particularly in election years, that are you know handing out pencils with their name, um, Joe Bob Smith for County Commissioner District Three, and it's to you know remind people to to go vote, and they would have the the date of the election. So you're handing these out if you're going to these. The reason I bring this up is that you're going to this bean supper for for Democrats, and you're handing it out to people who are likely to vote. They're, they're showing up. They're obviously interested in politics as opposed to putting an ad on television where, for example, in Logan County and in Guthrie, you couldn't afford, if you're running for Guthrie City Council or Logan County Commissioner, which you know I've run campaigns for those, those offices, you can't afford to get on television, right? You can't afford to get on four, five, or nine for those kinds of offices. You, you see people getting on television in Oklahoma City, which is a huge market, but even then you have this enormous amount of wasted coverage because again, the Oklahoma City area goes from Shawnee in the east to El Reno in the west, from Guthrie in the north to Purcell in the south. And if you're running for Oklahoma City Council and you're getting on, or, or Oklahoma County Commissioner, and you're getting on ABC, NBC, and CBS, to have these little advertisements, and they do from time to time. You'll get candidates that have enough money to, to buy television ads in those markets. Who's voting? It's just the voters in Oklahoma City. The Oklahoma City SMSA is now over 1.5 million people. How many of those people live in actually Oklahoma City? Well, about 500,000. So only about a third of them, but they're all giving, getting the local news coverage. And so you've got an enormous amount of wasted coverage. Whereas if you're going out and handing these promotional products out at the Democrat women's barbecue and bean supper, you're getting people who are likely voters. They are interested in politics and you're not wasting your coverage on, you know, sending out messages to people in, in, the village who can't vote for Oklahoma City Council, or Edmond. Um, Edmond straddles the line between two counties. So if you're a county commissioner running in Oklahoma County, you're reaching people in Logan County. That That is a, a waste of coverage, right? Flexibility, there's a lot that you can choose from here. And these kinds of promotional products often are tailored to what is the latest sort of thing that everybody wants. When, and, and it's amazing to me, I, I have a colleague um, in our department who just the other day said, I can't find my jump drive for class today. I don't know what I've done with it. And he's like freaking out. And I'm like, seriously, you actually still use a, a jump drive? Like, why would you do that? 
I mean, like, why would you use a drum? Like, you put it on the network, and then like you can pull it up from any cloud, right? I mean, you don't have to like worry about this. But at one point in time, jump drives were the bomb. Everybody wanted again. Going back to when I was a kid, my mother had this IBM that used these big floppies that were very fragile. If you got them anywhere close to a magnet, that was it. They were gone. They 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 it would destroy the data on them. If they got wet, it would destroy the data. And then they came out with these smaller ones. Um, they were like a three by five floppy, and they were actually in a hard case, which made them more uh, durable than the others. But still, it was something that was you know fairly. And professors used to bring these into class and put them into the the drive on the computer and pull up their lecture notes or whatever, or their PowerPoints. And then all of a sudden we got these static drives called jump drives that that was like the bomb. And every promotional product at every sort of career fair or trade show that I went to, they were handing out floppies or not floppies, um, jump drives with the company names on them. Right? It was a way of reminding. And it's something that you're going to use over and over and over again. So these become whatever is sort of the latest rage in the area, those become popular promotional product gifts to give to people. Fidget spinners, how many of you remember fidget spinners? Those were popular, what, three or four years ago, maybe five years ago, everybody. And all of the promotional products that you'd go to, or when I go to um, competitions, all of the, the companies that want our sales students were handing out fidget spinners. And then there were the fidget cubes that you know came out that gave you more stuff to, to fidget with. So whatever is sort of popular is what, what promotional products people generally will get. Um, you, you don't see a lot of people anymore handing out, again, it used to be pens and pencils because how many people actually write things down? How many of you actually know how to write cursive? They do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> they don't teach yeah. it anymore. They teach it uh, like my nephew and niece. Like he's like private school, like optional or whatever. They do. They teach it enough for them to be able to sign their name. Is basically what they do. They teach you enough so that you can sign. Why did they stop cur teaching cursive? Like what? Uh, why would you use it? You've got a pet. I think it's a horrible idea. And there's a lot of studies that show that you really should engage in writing. One of the things that I noticed this before there were even studies on this, when I went to law school, I, I took a laptop and I used the laptop in taking notes. And one of the things that I noticed, and I stopped doing it about halfway through my first semester in law school, one of the things I noticed was I wasn't retaining as much knowledge because I took typing in high school. My mother insisted that I was going to take typing. And at the time, I was horrified by this. I was like, I'm not going to be a secretary. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm not going to need to type. And she's like, trust me, you're not going to have a secretary when you go to college and you're going to need to learn how to type. And so I took typing and this was actually on a typewriter, which you don't see anymore. Like you sit there and they would give you like memos to type and stuff like that. And you would learn how to, to type. I got really, really proficient at it. I can type accurately 120 words a minute. Um, so I can keyboard about 120 words a minute. What I noticed when I was in law school is that I was taking down every single thing that the professor was saying as they were lecturing because I could type really, really fast. And then I wasn't really remembering it because if you actually write it down, if you block print, you can't do this. And that's one of the problems with them not teaching cursive. Cursive is a very efficient way of writing very quickly and getting lots of words down. But you can't, if you were doing taking notes this way, you can't take down every word. You have to sort of absorb what the professor's saying, translate it into some kind of shortened formula where you're leaving out things like all of the articles um, that, that may go with something. And you're just getting the basic concepts down. And that, that really triggers deep learning or deep recall because you're having to think about what's being said and then trans, uh, translate it into something that's gonna make sense for you later where you have enough of the information that you're going to remember what was said, but not so much that you're getting down every single word, right? So they used to have lots of pens and pencils and things like that that people would pass out. Those are going away. Banks still use them because that's one place where people still do use, you know, a pen or pencil when they go in to make a deposit. Although even that anymore, how many of you have been into a bank in the last year to make a deposit? 
All of your stuff probably comes through direct deposit from your employer. That's your your only source. Or and you can take a picture. Or you can take a picture of the check now, and <laughs> you can if somebody actually gives you a check. I don't know why anybody would do this anymore, but if somebody actually gives you a check, you can take a picture of the check and and send it to the bank, and they will you know it will will automatically deposit and credit into your account. So pens and pencils, things like that, are are, are not necessarily the big promotional items that they used to be. Um, calendars, it, this was big with insurance. Insurance agents would send out an annual calendar and usually several formats to all of their clients. This is something you'd hang up. People would actually hang them up in their homes, you know, in the, uh, usually in their kitchens, and it would have the insurance agent's name, and they would have desk calendars as well that they would send out to people that, you know, it's got the, the, the name of the insurance agency that you're sitting there reminded every single day that this is your agent and, and they love you and they've sent you the stuff again. Why would you do that today when you've got this device that keeps everything for you? And if you need a calendar, it's like watches. That's the other thing. They're taking clocks out of classrooms because kids, why would you need that? You've got a phone. Like, well, why look at that? You know what time it is. Look at your, look at your phone, right? I mean, that's not nearly as accurate as looking at your phone, which is set with a nuclear clock. So why would you why would you need it? Um, so they they have a tendency to to do whatever is the the current trend in these areas. Um, Keychains, pens, calendars remain with customers for long periods of time. If you've got promotional products, you generally you know you keep them around. They've got they sit on your desk, whatever, and and it's a reminder. Um, some are very expensive. Some of the costs that they that they have and some of the items. One of my friends, Amy Kelly, owns a promotional uh, product company here in Oklahoma City that does this. Some of them are really expensive. The thing that became very popular, uh, along with fidget spinners, in the last um, year or so has been the the insulated cups. Like the um, they're a knockoff brand of the first one to do these sort of thermal insulated cups was. I think, I think it was Yeti was the first one to come out with sort of these really decent cups. Now there are lots of knockoffs, but even the knockoffs, if you get those as a promotional product and you give it to somebody, are fairly expensive. That, that's a fairly expensive item to get. You're not spending pennies like you were on a pen or pencil where you could get, you know, thousands of pens or pencils for just a, you know, maybe one or two cents a piece. This is a more substantial. So it is expensive, but many are not. But like I said, a lot of them um, are no longer really, people don't really want them because pens and pencils, why would you need that? Um, goodwill that they, bring, that they bring people like gifts. I don't know why. We, we love swag. If you go to a career fair or a trade show or something like that, it's amazing how much people want crap. I mean, they, they want stuff. Sunglasses, that's another one that's become popular at, at the career fairs is the sunglasses with, you know, Paycom or um, Loves or things like that. So it leads to a high degree of recall and brand imaging because people, you know, they've got it, they're wearing it, they're remembering it. Um, and it's a good supplement to other media. The disadvantages. Um, you can have brand dilution if it's a cheap or chintzy or poorly designed product that breaks. One of the things that the company that I worked for did is the president of the company got a promotional watch from one of these, and he decided that we needed to give that watch to every distributor out there. And so he ordered all these watches and they were fairly expensive and they weren't very good and they broke and people, you know, like, were like, this is the worst watch I've ever seen. It, it quit after three months, you know, the battery's dead and it leaked and, and it was, uh, it was a, you know, poor design. It didn't fit well. It wasn't really adjustable. And I, I tried to tell him, I was like, I don't think that's, you know, you're not going to get me to wear the watch. Um, saturation, the value declines. Um, if a replacement is easily uh, available for the product, the production time can be significant depending on the products. Now, these have, again, become easier with modern manufacturing techniques, but you can still have a significant production time if you're doing things like T-shirts, for example, 
All of the competitions we go to have t-shirts. Everybody, I don't know why people love t-shirts, but everybody wants t-shirts and the production time of those can take quite a bit of time um, compared to some of the other things that you can do. And the reach is very limited, obviously. You're only gonna get those people that are at the trade show or um, career fair or whatever it is that you're, that you're marketing at, at that moment. So you're not gonna reach a broader audience. It's difficult to measure and there's no clearly established measurement systems for promotional products. There are some ad hoc research uh, in the field. Uh, some of it suggests that 70% of uh, consumers have received a promotional item in the last 12 months. Probably everybody here has received some kind of promotional item as you've walked across campus. You've got various vendors that come on campus that try to get you um, to sign up with their services at the bookstore. They put little promotional products. If you buy an actual hard copy or tangible copy of the book in, in the bags, if you go through the student union, there's always some group in there that's trying to, to market something. 88% of people that have participated in surveys say that they recall the advertiser's name. 83% say they like receiving promotional products. Again, we like gifts as, as people. We, we enjoy that. There's some thrill in, in getting that. 33% say it's a constant reminder of the advertiser and 53% use a promotional product once a week. I have lots of pens from Bank First, for example, in my car I'm constantly. And I use, I actually take a, a, an actual list into the grocery store with me and I use the Bank First pen to, to mark off stuff on my list as I go through. 71% um, of people actually generally keep it. Why is that? Why do we generally keep the stuff that people, the crap that people send us? Why do we keep that? Because it's free. Because it's free. Yeah. It makes you feel good. Sometimes it's something that's useful. It's useful. Okay. I think those are all good responses as to why we keep them. I think another one is just as, as much of a consumer disposable culture as we have become, we still have some amount of clinging to, why is this not moving? Come on, I'm over here. Let's move. These don't work very well. <laughs> the first ones of these that they had when I was uh, teaching in New Mexico State had a fob that you know would send out a signal and it would actually follow. It did a much better job. This one, there always seems to be a delay in this. And so it's like looking off into voids of space that I that I'm no longer occupying. But as much as we have become a disposable culture and things are not necessarily rebuilt or reused like they used to be in the past, I think we still have some remnants of middle class morality that says we shouldn't waste stuff. And it, it's a it's a waste to just chunk something into uh, the the trash can if it's still got any sort of useful purpose to it. And we all have this stuff around our house. I still have, I made fun of my colleague for still using a jump drive. I still have jump drives. I have no idea what's on them, but I refuse to get rid of them because there may be something that, you know, I'll go through it and find something that's useful at some point in, in my life. I doubt it, um, but I still keep it. And some of them have these, these advertisements on them because I got these jump drives at um, various, you know, trade shows that we would go to when I worked in the, in the public or in the private sector. Yellow pages, these are mostly, I know this is really out of date because most of you have never even seen a yellow page or a, a phone book. Um, some old people still use them um, so that you can still get them, but yellowpages.com uh, has become increasing as we find stuff online. There actually used to be not just yellow pages, but this is really, really, really dating myself. You used to have local directories of everybody that had a phone that was listed by the phone company and they would put these out and you could actually find people. Now you have to use Facebook or some other search engine to, to find people and to find ways of getting to them. And if, if you do find their phone number, they're probably not going to answer the phone because you have this device that we call a telephone and nobody actually uses it to call anymore. 
nobody actually wants to talk to anybody. You'd rather text or instant message or Snapchat or do anything else other than actually talk to another human being. I don't know why. This is a, a big thing. My generation, it was a big deal for kids to have their own phone line, which we did. My brother and I had our own phone line so that we weren't you know, utilizing our parents' phone line. Um, you all have grown up with these devices, and so you don't even know what that, that was like. So, but we actually like to talk on the phone, whereas my mother's generation, they don't like to talk on the phone because they didn't grow up talking on the phone. It was expensive. Uh, again, I'm going to date myself. When I was a kid growing up and when we moved to Guthrie in 1986 from New Mexico, Oklahoma City was a long distance phone call. And so it cost about $1.50 a minute um, after the initial, I think you got three minutes for a, a flat rate and then it was like $1.50 a minute to call from Guthrie to Oklahoma City. And, and so like you know, my parents' generation remembers that and everything was a long distance phone call for them pretty much. And so like, they didn't actually like to talk on the phone. They liked to actually go visit and see people in person. Whereas my generation, we wanted to talk on the phone. That was a, that was a big deal was to be able to have your own phone line and to talk on the phone. I am about out of time. We'll talk about, I guess I didn't have um, a movie theater advertising. Uh, and then I'll stop for the day. Um, relatively low cost. You, you've got a captive audience. The problem is that the, the biggest one of these, this was really new when it started in, in the late 1990s. They started using movie theater. People would get, people would actually show up at movie theaters early so that they could get the good seat that they wanted because everybody has a preferred seat in the, in the movie theater. Mine was always, I wanted to be towards the back and on the aisle so that I could get out easily because I have this paranoia about being trapped by people in, in a movie theater. But um, particularly after COVID, what has happened? Nobody goes to the movie theater. Like there's very few, like, why would you go to the movie theater? Almost everything is instantly released to, you know, some streaming service that, that you can watch in the comfort of your own home. And we all now have these gigantic televisions, which um, allow us to have virtually the same effect as you'd have is if you went to the theater itself and probably better because the resolution is, is so much greater on a lot of the um, high def screens. All right. That's a good place to stop. We'll talk about, uh, I will try to talk first about the marketing plan or the IMC plans for you and uh, on Tuesday. All right. Or Thursday. Yeah, this is a Thursday class. I get confused. So what day is it? If you got ducks, come see me so I can give you points. And I will see you all in a week. Thank you. Maybe a family.